welcome to this special CNBC Africa broadcast in recognition and celebration of the 70th anniversary and fifth biennial conference of the CSIR. I'm Nozi Pombanjwa. In today's conversation, we're going to be unpacking, exploring, and maybe challenging the role that science, technology, innovation, and institutions like the CSI play in meeting the socio-economic challenges that define our country, our broader continent, and the global landscape. And bringing their voices to this conversation is my panel of experts who I will introduce in a moment. For you at home, if you want to be a part of these conversations, you can certainly do that. All you need to do is tweet us, of course. The hashtag is CSIR70 and CSIR conference. And now to bring their voices, their insights, and their experiences to bear in this conversation, please help me welcome my panel. The Minister of Science and Technology in South Africa, Minister Naledi Pando, the CEO of the CSIR, that's Dr. Sibusiso Sibisi, a distinguished fellow and lead scientist at Argonne National Laboratory in the USA, Dr. Michael Thackeray, Director of IBM Research Africa, responsible for the South African lab, Dr. Solomon Asefa, the Vice President and Head of Disruptive Innovation at Airbus Defense and Space, Jan van Tour. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Minister, perhaps let's start off with the conversation by you giving us context of the importance of science, technology and innovation in the economic ambitions, not only of this country, but of the broader continent. Well, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Firstly, um, in all countries that uh, I have studied that have had uh, successful uh, economic progress, none of them have been able to achieve that progress without investment in science, technology and innovation. Countries that we admire today, that we regard as most successful, have been very clever about how they invest in science, technology and innovation. And that occurs uh, in a range of ways. Firstly, you must have the human capital. Mm -hmm. But I believe you have to have institutions such as the CSIR, which become your foundation and your strategic edge in ensuring that you address uh, the range of objectives that you have. In South Africa, we're striving very hard to pursue economic growth, but also to attend to three challenges, which are poverty, inequality, as well as unemployment. And we constantly ask the CSIR, how do you respond to these? How do you use science, technology, and innovation in order to uh, address these challenges. Now, it won't happen uh, at the first instance of investment or project development. It takes time, but the benefit is of very long duration. So if you develop a new drug to address tuberculosis in the health uh, section of the CSIR, you're helping us attend to a very serious health pandemic uh, in South Africa, but on the continent as well. You're producing a drug that we will market in the commercial space. You're improving the uh, success of our public health system to address a very difficult problem. And you also create the capacity for the emergence of a new pharmaceutical uh, uh, sector uh, in South Africa. Mineral resources are an important area. Uh, Africa has relied on extraction of mineral resources, a rich resource it has, sending all of this out there and purchasing back beneficiated products. Mm. You work with an institution like CSIR to see whether you can indeed value add and you identify minerals that can play a role in this particular sector and your scientists contribute to you developing novel technologies, novel approaches to value addition and thus converting what is extracted and exported into a product that you value add in here and then you export it as a high-end product for which your country generates huge economic benefit. Dr. Sbisi, so the minister has laid out what's supposed to happen in theory. It's been 70 years. To what extent has the CSIR been able to meet some of the developmental challenges that the minister has outlined? It's a long-term play, as she has indicated. What has been a notable achievement in 70 years? There are so many. It's, it's um, difficult to pick um, just one. However, I will, I will do so, because it, 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 is, it so happened that it's represented by the gentleman um, to my right here, uh, Dr. Michael Thackeray, 
who was part of the CSR community, moved subsequently to Alcon National Lab in the US. As you can see, he remains a part of uh, the community that uh, we work with in this particular instance. The development, uh, the, the work that I worked on as development of uh, batteries, um, an area called lithium ion batteries, which are used um, for energy storage today, for powering your cell phones um, and, and so on. Now, that is but one example of um, scientists working on all the stages of activity, ranging from fairly fundamental chemistry to developing a product that then finds application in this particular instance in, a, in, in, in an industrial context. But some other areas of work might lead to application that makes a difference in people's lives through um, better health, through a better environment, improved safety. Safety, um, classic example, given that South Africa um, is um, a country that is uh, so reliant on, uh, on natural min on mineral resources. It is important to be able to um, bring technology to bear in, for example, mining in a manner that is not going to compromise mm. people's lives. Um, you know, so that there's early warning systems, for example, in the event of a possible rockfall uh, underground, might blast in such a manner that you do not compromise the structures as much as you might. So what you ultimately extract from the ground, uh, the, the titanium ore, whatever it, it may be, has involved a whole raft of other activities uh, that c uh, technology can assist in uh, enabling us to, um, you know, to, to manage better. Mm. Dr. Thackeray, you have the foresight and uh, the, 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 the uh, advantage of having been in the South African context and in other markets. What is your view around the kind of investment that flows into science, technology and innovation? How does South Africa compare when we pit ourselves against other emerging markets and the developed markets like the US where you're based now? Well, if I can just go back to what Dr. Savisi said, you know, I, I was here at the CSR for 20 years. Uh, we started, and my, and, 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 and my game is, uh, is, is energy and lithium ion batteries in particular. Um, I had 20 years of a, a tremendous career here at the CSR in South Africa, and for various reasons, I got the opportunity to, to, uh, to go to the States, and I carried on with exactly what I was doing uh, in the United States. And I think it's was really comforting for me when I took my family across. Uh, it was into a different world and in, and in different environment, but the, the, uh, the likeness between Argonne National Lab Laboratory in the United States was so akin to CSIR. The, 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 from that standpoint, the transition was remarkably smooth. Uh, CSIR had the, uh, um, the talents uh, and the capabilities just like Argonne had. So that was a, that was a huge thing. But I, I can say one other thing, and that is when we started on this lithium ion battery initiative at, at CSR with the Johan Kutzer, we didn't know anything about batteries. We started very small, and it took us 20 years, and we developed a couple of very, very meaningful products. When I got to the United States, they were starting off in lithium ion technology, and it's taken us a good 15, 20 years to do exactly the same. So there are very, very strong parallels. And I believe that this country uh, has got huge opportunities in the energy space. And going back to the, the mining industry, which is the start of everything in terms of minerals beneficiation, you've got all the minerals here that uh, can go into lithium ion batteries, huge opportunity. And uh, um, I'm here in, in part to speak to the CSR, the DST, uh, and various universities to see how we can uh, get things uh, going together and to help in this part of the world. And Dr. Thackeray, we'll come back to that because it will be interesting to get a sense from you what's been the appetite and the uptake, especially from uh, a sector like the, ma the mining sector, which is the backbone of the economy, right. to get into the innovative space and to think in a different manner. But before we do that, you spoke about uh, South Africa and you've, you've spoken about the U.S., but... Uh, Dr. Solomon, perhaps you could come in and give us a, a continental perspective. Uh, IBM Research Africa straddles really South Africa and Kenya, which seem to be the technology hubs on the continent. Are these the only places where we're seeing a hive of activity and investment in science, technology, and innovation? And is it possible for us to replicate some of these successes into other parts of the continent? It's definitely possible to replicate the successes that we have already had in these two countries. There's a lot of activity that's happening in many countries thro throughout the continent. But I think you have to first put it in context when you talk about 
science and technology and the impact that it's having in you know, socioeconomic impact that it's having, right? Um, first of all, if you look at the technologies that we take for granted, you know, the amount of computational power we have at the finger of our, you know, at the tip of our fingers, uh, if you look at many other things, it's because of decades of investment that have happened in science and technology. So for the continent and for Africa to really stay relevant, we have to make sure that we continuously invest in science and technology. So there's a lot of activities that are happening in terms of innovations uh, in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. We feel that we have figured out a model on how to utilize that investment for figuring out cutting edge technologies and also for making sure that the local ecosystem is involved in developing those technologies. So we are very optimistic. What does that model need? for it to take off in other markets? Because it's one thing to have a model, but you also need a conducive environment to enable that replication uh, in other markets. What is it that's been right in the South African and the Kenyan context that has allowed uh, such models to be built? What do you need in other markets? So first, you, ha you actually have to take time to engage the right stakeholders. In our case, it's about talking to government and understanding national priorities. For example, really understanding the NDP and as well as the local RDI agenda, which has been planned for five to 10 years, right? So really coming in and understanding it and engaging government is very important. The second aspect of it is actually going and talking to universities. There's a lot of research that's already happening throughout the continent. It's just that it hasn't gotten visibility. So you have to spend time connecting the dots and talking to the people on the ground who are actually doing the research. The third and key component of the success is actually talking to local entrepreneurs. The way we do research is changing fast. Companies like IBM and others are really also adapting the way they do research. So it's important to bring in startups, entrepreneurs, and connecting, to, connecting them to the scientists so that they do core innovation, so that they're able to develop intellectual property together and making sure that we have something that's very, very differentiating. Mm. So a couple of really important issues that you raise, and I see the ministers nodding as you talk about the connection with entrepreneurship, the intellectual property issues, so we'll get to those. But before we do that, let's quickly get uh, to Jan. Um, I think it's a very interesting uh, aspect that you might bring to this conversation, being in the defense space. And we've been talking about how do we match science, technology, and innovation to meet developmental challenges and targets that we're chasing on the continent. What role does space play in improving life on Earth? Yeah, for instance, uh, if you take a look at the activities we see today, that a number of large companies want to put thousands of satellites in space to generate a worldwide network so that every human being can interconnect himself with the rest of the world. And I feel this will be uh, a step change in the, in the exchange of knowledge, in the exchange of willingness to define complex systems in the future together and also to push innovation forward. There are so many people, uh, brilliant minds on earth. And I feel you have to connect them. Jan, we, the, currently in the global space, there's a real, real, very real challenge and a very hot debate around border security. Give us a sense what science and technology can do in order to, one, improve border security, but also taking cognizance of the sensitivities that this comes with in the global uh, international relations space. Yeah, border security is a large topic today in Europe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, for me, the, 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 question, the question is, uh, why, we, we, we are human mankind. Why do we have to integrate in our systems so much security? Why do we have to check so many people? As a matter of fact, everybody can put a chip in his ear and by my worldwide uh, network, I have the control over everybody. Yeah. Yeah? So, mistrust is not a good uh, characteristic against each other. We are neighbors. Yeah, why should you have border security against Mozambique? Yeah, you are all of the same 
We are all humans. I think that's a, a point that we should uh, reflect back uh, to the to the powers that be as this debate continues. And let's get back to the business of the day here. Minister, let's talk about the kind of incentives that we have in place, especially in the, in the South African and the continental aspect, to attract investment into science, technology and innovation. Are we doing enough to really say to the private sector, bring your dollars here. You will have fertile ground to, to invest in and we will guarantee you the returns that you're looking for. I think uh, we are trying to communicate that message. Um, South Africa has probably been better at doing that than several other countries on the continent. Uh, in terms of uh, international linkages, uh, Egypt, Tunisia and South Africa rank as the top three countries on the continent with international uh, uh, linkages, particularly through um, the European Union uh, framework programs, which are research and investment uh, uh, programs of the EU. Uh, but we are working with colleagues on the African continent to ensure that as many of us as possible benefit from these opportunities. Uh, so for example, for many years, uh, the three countries I referred to have been the ones with what are called national contact points mm. that um, al ally with uh, the EU uh, Commission uh, science agenda. We've now uh, begun a process of developing national contact points throughout the African continent, and South Africa has been running uh, uh, orientation programs and training and coordination of such uh, individuals appointed uh, uh, by the various uh, departments and ministries in as, African as countries. As a quick follow up to that mm -hmm. minister, investing in developmental <coughs> <coughs> targets, whether it's e-health or e-education and, and really infusing these uh, developmental areas with science and technology. Have we been able to communicate why this makes financial sense for the private sector? Or has there been a, a, a crowding out of private sector money as government takes the lead? Or have we made space to get as much of the required investment as possible? Well, um, I'm one of the ministers who will complain that we don't get enough money. <laughs> uh, uh, as probably most ministers uh, would. Uh, but uh, we have seen a decline in private sector investment uh, in research since the 2008 uh, crisis uh, uh, because private sector is faced with constraints, uh, as are governments. Uh, but we're seeing an uptick at the moment uh, because various international organizations, uh, such as OECD uh, and certainly our commission, the AU, have been asserting the importance of continued investment in research development and innovation, even in the most difficult times, because it is often at that period that you get the real innovation uh, uh, emerging. So uh, there's begun to be a turnaround. Countries are relooking at their budgets, and they are asserting the importance of continuing to invest in innovation. Dr. Solomon, I'm going to just bring you in very quickly here. So we're past 2008. Africa is now the new rising star when it comes to investment on the global agenda. It's at the top of every investor's uh, list. As a private sector player, these conversations that the minister refers to, are you really looking your, at your budgets and looking at African markets and looking at where else can we invest and how can we step up the investments that we've already made into science, technology and innovation? Absolutely. I think you have to understand that if we really want to push the technological frontier, we have to go to places where there are challenges and for the most part grand challenges. That's where the business opportunity actually lies. Hence, there's actually a big uh, kind of uh, case to be made about you know, investments, right? I mean, you look at grand challenges such as energy. Mm. There's a lot already that's in the pipeline in terms of te technological advancements but we do have to do new types of research on the continent depending on our own context, right? Same in healthcare. There's a lot of uh, technologies based on cognitive technology as well as artificial intelligence that's already transforming and completely changing the healthcare industry. And again, I mean, if we're looking at, uh, basically, if we want to change the healthcare industry, if we want to introduce efficiencies, science and technology has a big role to play. Same with urbanization, right? Urbanization, when uh, people are moving to cities, we have to look into transportation, 
air quality, and many other things. And all of them are interconnected, and these are things where technology plays a big role to solve. So the moment you continue to advance that technology, that means you have lots of opportunities for commercialization, hence the business case. I'm going to come to energy in a moment, uh, Dr. Thackeray, because I think your insights are going to be very meaningful here. But Dr. Sbisi, investments don't happen in a vacuum. Uh, you will need the infrastructure to support uh, investment into science, technology, and innovation. It's always difficult to speak about South Africa when speaking broadly about the continent when it comes to infrastructure. So perhaps give us a continent-wide uh, perspective, which might be different from what we see in South Africa. Is there investment into the infrastructure to make science, technology, and innovation investments viable? With the permission, allow me to disrupt the question a little <laughs> bit. Um, the investment in infra infrastructure, normally we understand infrastructure as referring to facilities, mm -hmm. buildings, uh, um, laboratories and so on. And that is absolutely essential in order to, be, of course, good governance and uh, to yeah. be able to conduct uh, the research as uh, we will talk about. But the emphasis has thus far been on the technologies and making a difference. Yes. The, but the primary element of it all is people. Yes. And when we speak infrastructure, maybe that's why we should start to be thinking of the, the brains of people. The knowledge is ultimately vested in people. And the, the people sitting around um, this room here today represent precisely uh, the richness, the wealth that enables us to, um, uh, to pursue the, the kinds of uh, activities that we are referring to. How here. do we grow so, the number of people in this room into, in, in, in other markets in Africa? So how do we make sure that the people infrastructure that you speak about is available? Is it about bringing the relationship with the universities closer? Where do we start to replicate the number of people that we have in this room? At the beginning. Um, <laughs> we, we, we ought to have uh, education systems that is paramount, it is absolutely fundamental to, yeah. to, to everything, that work and work well, and I think we would all agree on that, yeah. that um, is the, the underpinning uh, fabric uh, for success across the continent is, is that we ought to be um, encouraging people from a very young age, supporting them through, so that they acquire uh, the necessary education. And I'm not here just talking narrowly about uh, mathematics and science. I'm talking about a, a, a broader, um, all-encompassing education, that um, e economics and so on, at all levels, mm -hmm. all the way up to university. Because the nature of challenge that we face, although we may describe ourselves as a science and technology organization, in fact, it's manifestly multidisciplinary. It is complex. It requires the expertise of a variety of people. So you'll find that increasingly. The successful countries, the su successful institutions are those that acknowledge that complexity and therefore are going to require people who are able to function at, 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 at a level that is beyond simply saying I'm a chemist, I'm a physicist and so on. And once that is in place, I, I think we're ready to fly. Then the physical infrastructure yes. must then follow. Breaking out of those boundaries very quickly before I move on to ensure that there is an interrelatedness uh, between what is coming out as output from whether it's higher education and even lower education into the tertiary space, fusing with the, 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 the sector, the science, technology and, uh, and innovation space. Is it happening though? We know what we would like to see, but is it happening, uh, Dr. Are we seeing a fundamental shift and change in the way we're thinking about education and how education then becomes the, the bedrock of what we're trying to achieve? Slowly but surely it's happening, definitely. I think our Africa is changing. Um, for example, one of our real problems, and I think uh, which gives us the history and outcome we have today, is the poor investment in many African countries in higher education. Mm -hmm. This has shifted. We've recognized that that World Bank and IMF edict of basic education only was a real problem for Africa. Mm -hmm. So you've begun to see greater attention to higher education and increased attention by policymakers mm -hmm. to a science and technology innovation strategy. Uganda has recently published one. Kenya has had one over several years. Ethiopia is now really, I think, on the march. So many countries have recognized, yes, basic education, higher education critical, science, technology, and innovation vital. And you're seeing a shift. We're now talking about, at minimum, 1% of GDP invested in science, technology, and innovation. And several African countries like Tanzania are saying, actually, 1% is not good enough. You must move much higher, as they have in the developed world. So I think uh, 
we've recognized where the inadequacies have been, and it is governments that are making the shift. Mm. The fact that the heads of state discuss in an AU General Assembly a science, technology, and innovation strategy for Africa, I think is a huge positive. The fact that they were fully behind Africa getting the square kilometer array located in South Africa means boundless movement forward. And it's something we must build on and really use to make uh, uh, that leap uh, that I think uh, must happen. So those shifts are happening, Dr. Thackeray, and of course they're coinciding with the shift in demographics on the continent and really positioning us, us for a, a boundless opportunities in terms of what we can do with science, technology, and innovation to move forward. But I want us to come back to energy. Um, we, the South African experience uh, is perhaps top of mind for many of us in the room when it comes to energy constraints. But perhaps let's get a sense of whether outside of South Africa, continent-wise as well, are we beginning to think about innovation in the energy space to make sure that what drives economies, which is really uh, economic infrastructure, is in place and we are making the right investments to make sure that those things are happening? You know, absolutely. The, this century is going to largely be about energy. It really is. It's uh, one of the components that has to be addressed uh, in terms of the future of this planet. Um, there, are th th there are three main uh, forces at work. One is overpopulation, uh, a burgeoning population uh, on this earth. The second one is CO2 emissions. And I don't think that many people uh, on this planet today, in my opinion, are um, aware of the severity of that situation. And the third one is the use of energy, which is 90% supported by oil and coal uh, and natural gas uh, that, that contribute to, 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 uh, to global warming. This is a serious issue that goes right across all borders. Um, uh, and uh, if I can just take a step back and go just to the theme of this conference, which is ideas that work, you know, in that, there's uh, an element of success. An idea that works is successful. And those are the ideas that you're going to have to work on because successful ideas are going to be the ones that are going to draw investment. But success and, and new ideas only come through creativity and innovation, and you don't know what ideas are out there. So it's, it's a high-risk business. Mm. But I think that countries like South Africa have to identify those uh, technological, you know, s science has got many components. There's, there's basic science and there's, uh, and, and there's technological science. And the two are really integral. And this is, the, 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 going back to the, uh, the theme of the conference, ideas that work, speaks about an integrated science and technology infrastructure. You've got to have the basic science to support the technology developments. And I think this is what has really happened uh, at Argonne, in my experience there, here at the CSIR, we did it in a different way. We had some basic ideas, but we needed help. And that's another thing. If you need help in science, go and look for it. Mm. If we had tried to do it alone, uh, we would never have done it. We would have still been sitting here uh, trying to make the zebra system work. But we went abroad, and they were able to help us. That was the first sign of, uh, of, uh, of this international cooperation in very difficult times for South Africa because we had to operate almost below the radar screen right. because it is embarrassing. But as scientists, we weren't concerned with political things and we just got on with the job. And, uh, you know, and that was very successful. Uh, at, um, at, uh, at Argonne, we were very strongly supported by an applied uh, science program from the Department of Energy. But over the years, we've actually introduced now a lot of the Office of Science funding to do the basic science, which then complements the technology uh, development. And we were lucky. You know, every now and again, you have a lucky break. And we had one at Argonne about 10, 15 years ago. And that was successful. And now you've seen Argonne really grow. It's become the center of battery science and technology in the United States. So success, realizing and understanding when you've got an idea um, protected. Protect it if by all means, in whatever sense, scientifically or even technologically in terms of patents. Protect what you've got 
and uh, start working with the outside world with those people that are going to help you. Well, on that note of big ideas that need protection, let's take a short break. When we come back, we pick up uh, on that conversation and we hear from our panelists as they take this conversation even further as we try to explore and maybe even challenge how science, technology, innovation and institutions like the CSIR, what role have they played in helping this continent, the country and the global landscape in meeting the developmental challenges and, uh, and helping us meet the targets that governments have mandated and that are still chasing. Let's take a break. I'll see you in two minutes. Welcome back to the CNBC Africa special broadcast. We are looking at the role that science, technology and innovation and institutions like the CSIR have played in meeting the socio-economic challenges that we still face in the country, on the continent and in the world. And my panelists are all back to pick up on this issue. We're also going to be bringing in the voices of our live audience. Uh, they are standing by, ready to engage with our panel. Before we go to the live audience, Jan, let's come back to a key key theme that's come out of the conversations here. It's around uh, public-private partnerships and building relationships and really getting all uh, soldiers on board to meet uh, the targets that we have set. Can you give us a sense, especially because you come from a, a, a different environment, where you perhaps have seen models that have worked effectively, what has made those public-private partnerships in this space effective, and is there a lesson for us to draw as we seek to replicate some of those key learnings? Yeah, difficult, difficult question to <laughs> answer, <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not the space guy, I'm the modern defense guy. Yeah. Uh, there is one topic I know about is, for instance, this tanker aircraft of the UK, where they had this investment model where private people uh, put their money on the table to develop a tanker aircraft for the UK uh, Army and Air Force. Uh, and uh, what, what the UK is doing is they paying these investors every year a certain sum uh, for their uh, engagement in this project. And uh, of course, in, in times where we are all oriented at profit, it must be attractive. The advantage of the, for the Air Force has been, of course, they don't have to put so much money on the table by their own, because today we live in a, an environment mm. where defense budgets are cut almost everywhere especially in, in, in Europe, we see a, a decrease in, in defense spending. And uh, as as such partnerships uh, allow probably also in the future that we build up systems which serve the, the public security. Mm. Uh, I, I feel this is a large field where we see this kind of partnerships. And of course, there are European models. Dr. Smithy, let me get your comment in. And before we, we, we get that, just a quick question for you to think about, Dr. Thackeray. One of the really successful models around renewable energy emanates right here from South Africa with the Renewable Energy Program and how really the private sector and government and other players have come together. I'd like your comments on that. But Dr. Smithy, let's get your comment in first. No, I was following up on the thread of the mm. public-private partnership because indeed, we have models of that um, right here in, in, in a variety of projects yes. that we are involved in, uh, such as uh, one that involves uh, adding value to, uh, in this particular instance, um, uh, titanium, which is um, a mineral that we're very rich in. I'm told by people more knowledgeable on this than I am that we potentially have got, um, I see my colleague nodding, 65%. Of, of the world's titanium resources right here. Now, it's a metal that's um, light but strong and therefore very useful in, uh, say, medical implants and uh, aircraft components. We are working here already in, 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 in a in tight partnership with uh, the likes of Airbus, with, um, with, with um, ITC, a sister um, organization mm -hmm. in, in the public space, but also local companies like Aerosud and, um, and um, companies like Tronox who are interested, who may have started in the mining arena, but are interested in moving into the beneficiation arena. So th this is happening. The models of that, uh, as we speak now, mm. uh, that uh, we simply need to replicate more and scale up. 
And we have to find the secret source. And that's the, the question that I want to pose to you, Dr. Thay. What has been the secret source in getting the renewable energy program in South Africa right? And, and, and how do we then replicate this in other sectors? Well, the, the, the whole renewable sector has still got a long way to go. It's, mm. it's, it's almost in its infancy. But of course, South Africa is blessed with uh, lots of sunshine and, uh, and, 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 and pockets of wind as well. Um, my feeling on this is that we're on the tip of the iceberg um, in, in, in terms of going forward. Uh, renewables, in my mind, are going to play an absolutely key role, and batteries, for example, and renewables are going to be inextricably linked. Uh, I don't think that we're as sufficiently advanced, and particularly in this country, in terms of that renewable program. I know that there's a lot of momentum that's being gathered. I'm just a little bit surprised that even worldwide things aren't happening faster. And they have the potential for moving faster because silicon chips and the, uh, you know, the cost of the solar arrays is, is really coming down. And there's a big opportunity now uh, that needs to be accelerated. Uh, and I think this is where South Africa does have uh, a huge opportunity in terms of linking with the outside world and bringing in and almost being one of the leaders uh, for implementing uh, solar technology, wind technology, coupled to the energy sector. Uh, and I think you can play that into the ESCOM uh, picture I immediately for benefits for this country. Uh, okay, quick comments. I have to go to the audience. I yes. can't steal you well, for myself. We're, we're among the top 10 countries in the world mm -hmm. investing in renewables at the moment. Yes. Right. The Independent Power Producers Program has put us at the leading edge of this, and it's extremely exciting. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we congratulate government as well as the private sector uh, because proper policy is necessary before you make such moves. Absolutely. And the fact that the government committed to a very strong IPP and renewables contribution to the energy resources of South Africa has put us in an excellent space. So it's also a question of cutting edge policy Absolutely. to bring in the investment. Yeah. Let's get the two comments and then let's go to the floor. Yeah, uh, okay. go, go ahead. Yeah. I wanted to add something to the colleagues' his remarks. What I feel is today, if we take a look at energy, we focus our efforts too much on the conventional to topics like wind energy, like solar energy. Uh, I feel there is an urgent need to do a substantial basic science in alternative energies like magnetic driven generators or there are a number of topics which are driven by water. You can take a look at the internet and the internet is full of people with brilliant ideas for generating new energy. And you must be able by basic, basic science to analyze their ideas and to pick out the ones which are good for the future. Mm. And I feel, as a South Africa, what you said, we have a lot of sun, we have a lot of wind. But that, that are industries which are built up already in China, even the Germans, we cannot compete with the Chinese systems anymore. So I feel South Africa has the opportunity uh, to find a niche in energy generation, which we still not have. You are new, a new kid on the block. And, and you have the chance, and by basic science, to find new methods to generate energy and to market this worldwide. So there are opportunities in being the new kid on the block in some areas. So let's get you a quick comment, uh, Dr. Solomon, then we'll go to the floor. On the topic of PPP, I think it's uh, important to be a bit more scientific about it, actually. You know, when you go into partnerships, I think it's important to identify challenges that you want to solve that are interesting for the involved stakeholders. So that's extremely important. And then also to really have good agreements on the deliverables that you want, and then having clear KPIs, right? So in our case, for example, oftentimes when we work with universities or research institutes, we definitely identify research topics that we feel like will transform an industry or a country or a continent, right? And then we also bring into the picture the fact that we need to work on human capital, which is important for government, right? Making sure that interns are involved, students, you know, postdocs, visiting scientists, all of these 
things need to come together and you need to have clear deliverables. Clear deliverables and a scientific approach if we want PPPs to work. So on that note, let's come to our audience. Let's get an indication of the questions. I think there's a question in the front. We'll take one, two, and we'll take three. Um, please, can we get the roving mic? Thank you very much, ma'am. Please go ahead. Good morning, I'm Nikki Kurbanali. I head up the CSR's Licensing and Ventures Office. Um, perhaps I'd like to direct my question to Dr. Solomon. Um, earlier this morning, the Deputy President mentioned science as an instrument of enterprise, and particularly when it comes to small enterprise development. Do you think that there's a role that large business can play uh, in enabling small business to appreciate the value of science and also in uh, terms of successfully commercializing the research that comes out of organizations like the CSR. Nikki, thank, thank you, you very much for your question. Let's get the question uh, at, from the middle table, ma'am, please. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Please go ahead. My name is Igor Glethill and I'm from the CSR, uh, where we're celebrating looking ahead 70 years into the uh, into the picture that we see. So I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Fantour to look um, into 2090 at disruptive technologies of which he may be aware that will have created the most employment opportunities in South Africa. What would you see for us? Thank you very much, uh, fantastic question. Uh, and let's get the third question from the same table. Please go ahead. Good morning, thank you very much. My name is Bidumelo Semete. I head up the Biosciences Unit of the CSR. My question is directed to the Honorable Minister. Um, Minister, I think as a country, we've done very well and government has supported us very well in terms of attracting um, international stakeholders in R&D development. Um, but I think what, what I'd like to know is how is government assisting us in attracting industry, particularly, and, and I refer to the bioeconomy sector, speaking to pharmaceuticals and the broader sectors around that, to say what efforts are in place to ensure that we attract industry to do R&D on this continent to enable us to take these innovative technologies that we've developed to move them along the value chain such that they have then the socioeconomic impact that we envisage. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So let's take that as one round of questions and we'll come back for a second round. Uh, perhaps, Minister, let's, let's, let's start off with the last question that's been posed. How are we attracting industry to do research and development here? Um, well, we've begun to see uh, some excellent examples of that happening. We've mentioned IBM, for example, and the research laboratory that will be established in Johannesburg. And of course, General Electric uh, recently made the announcement the deputy president referred to. But in the policy space, which is where I am, we have a very attractive tax incentive mm. uh, scheme where uh, industry can recoup over 150% of its investments in R&D in South Africa. And it's a very attractive scheme. In fact, I'm told it's one of the most attractive in the world. It's just been hugely administrative. We've had to alter some of that in order to make it uh, more attractive. Uh, furthermore, We've uh, built a national intellectual property management uh, unit within the Department of Science and Technology to ensure that we provide the appropriate legal, uh, I think, uh, a guardianship to ensure that those who partner with government, uh, particularly in uh, the state-owned corporations, as well as in science councils and universities, are assured that they would have uh, protected protection should they uh, uh, contract with us. With respect to the pharmaceutical space, I think some very exciting things are going to happen because we are committed to establishing a state-owned pharmaceutical company. And we've set about this in partnership with the private sector. So taking a South African company in the pharmaceutical space, uniting it with a state-owned entity, and establishing a new uh, institution that will uh, be very active in the biotechnology space, particularly with respect to new pharmaceutical products, but also integrating work we've invested in, in indigenous knowledge systems, and seeing how we can derive new treatments and products out of that unity. And I think uh, the private sector getting to know about what the state is doing and its science institutions has been a very big revelation for me, which alerted me to the fact that we are not communicating uh, effectively. Because at every point, 
I get surprised that, oh, South Africa has this capacity. We didn't know. So we need to get better at getting out there. But I think uh, our biotechnology space is really exciting uh, uh, for the future. We haven't yet gone where we should with biofuels. I think in terms of energy, we haven't done what we can with biomass, with waste management. There's so many opportunities. And these are huge for job creation and enterprise formation. Dr. Smith, I see that you want to add to the point. No, I mean, Minister has, has covered the topic very well indeed. But I, I think there is a, a dimension um, as well that I think ne needs to be um, uh, brought up. It is that I think we also need to think rather differently as well when we think about these things. That it's not necessarily the case that if we want to advance in, in biotechnology and bioscience pharmaceuticals, we need to be thinking about companies that are necessarily in that space. What I have in mind here is the fact that um, IBM here, for example, we, many of us will think of it uh, of IBM as an uh, IT uh, company, but in fact, um, the work that people are currently most uh, excited about, that um, arguably that IBM is doing, is work that has um, found application in biotechnology right. through um, intelligence, if you like, machine intelligence, machine learning that enables them to assist the research project uh, of, for example, trying to find um, potential uh, drug candidates for, 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 for cancer. It might be for HIV and so on and so forth. So I think what we ought to be looking at is if there is indeed uh, uh, an IBM research presence in South Africa. How does that, for example, couple with our activities in bioscience to find a, a new and different way of att attacking these problems, particularly in an era where this kind of work is becoming so fundamental across all sciences? Absolutely. Let's move on to Dr. Solomon, uh, the question around uh, an integration relationship between large and, uh, and med small and medium-sized enterprises. Your, your insights there? So, indeed, uh, big companies, commercial companies, are very effective when it comes to commercialization of uh, technologies. And that's because of two reasons. One, they could do a lot of investment into the business development of that, for that technology. And, uh, and second, they oftentimes have big R&D arms, right? But what we have found out is over time, actually, the technologies that we have invented ourselves are disrupting our business models, right? Mm -hmm. So you often see one-man companies that are doing extremely well and really disrupting big industries, right? Mm -hmm. So that has really made us rethink our engagement with small and medium enterprises. So for example, uh, uh, some of the newest technologies that we have in artificial intelligence, our Watson cognitive technology, we're making it accessible over the cloud and on, the, on people's mobile phones. And that is because we actually want entrepreneurs to use it and come up with newer technologies, right? We also have set up a lot of investment opportunities, enterprise development opportunities, so that you know, entrepreneurs could come in and work on differentiating intellectual property. And I think that's critical. So big companies know how to develop intellectual property, while small companies oftentimes are not very well aware of that. So we like working together with them in terms of the business development as well as intellectual property as well. Again, IP being a big uh, theme that's uh, quite recurrent in the conversation and hopefully we'll get a question around that. But let's get to, to Izal's question around uh, looking forward 70 years from now and uh, how do we make sure we have technologies or disruptive technologies that are going to generate the highest employment numbers? Yes, okay. Yeah, you have to perform a quest in basic science because it's my personal opinion that all innovations come out of basic science. We see it also at CSIR, but everywhere in the world, we put a lot of effort in the improvement of existing products. And this will gen generate certainly not the increase in employment here. You have to find the niche where you can excellent, yeah, where you are excellent. It's one of the niches. You are a spearhead in additive layer manufacturing. So you have the resources in country. So why don't you limit the export of titanium and tell the guys who buy your titanium today, we will make the substructures for you. Yeah? And you generate a number of these added layer manufacturer machines. They are very impressive. I have never seen a, a comparable one worldwide. And, and you will get more value for your system. And there are a number of such things. Uh, air transportation. If you take a look at what 
happening today is all the companies in the world who deal with aerospace copy the classical designs. Yeah? But is that competitive? Because everybody buys the same engine, everybody buys the same equipment, and the only thing where they get value from is the overall system design and, and no, metal bending. Yeah? So here I feel you don't have the ballast out of the past. You can start up an aerospace company from scratch and you can integrate revolutionary technologies, which we don't do because we say we have to change our uh, concept and that is most too costly. But you don't have this limit boundary. You can go for something much better. And then what happens then, and this is valid also for other products, if you are better as the rest of the world, yeah, you will make the market for yourself and then you generate also the jobs. But you have to be better. And one source is basic research. That's the best source. Yeah? And, and the integration of emerging technologies in existing, uh, existing products uh, to step change them in quality or performance or limit in cost. Mm. Another theme, uh, just as we begin to wrap, uh, Dr. Sbisi, uh, that came up very early on in the conversation was around this connectedness of uh, science, technology and innovation and entrepreneurs. We've seen uh, the likes of South Africa and Kenya really becoming leaders on the continent. Again, I'm looking for the secret source. How do we ensure that uh, we can hardwire this so that we've got models that we can take to other parts of the continent and really begin to see silicon savannas in more than just one region? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure that there is necessarily one single model. Um, you just have to have, a, I guess, that much overused word, an ecosystem that mm. um, uh, is going to allow for that sort of thing to happen. It, it, it's very difficult to be definitive about uh, what are the exact. And people have tried the exact characteristics that uh, made a Silicon Valley come about. You, you can identify things like, for example, the presence of good universities, Stanford, and, and so on and so forth, the presence of uh, or the, um, funding from the um, uh, Department of Energy and so on. And various countries have tried to do that. We ourselves are, are keenly aware of the importance of uh, forming such an ecosystem. But I, I think what we're looking at, or what, what we do, for example, at CSR, is to take a, a two-pronged approach to this. Uh, at the simplest level, it's more complex than that. The one is to seek to stimulate the birth of new companies, new enterprises through technologies that we have developed. Mm -hmm. And because we are not primarily, ultimately, entrepreneurs ourselves, we then must find ways of uh, partnering with other people who, who know, have, have got better now, as it were, at um, commercializing things and running businesses. Mm -hmm. And, um, and th th that's one uh, element. The other element is simply developing new areas of technology that might not necessarily spawn a single uh, a small startup company, but a whole new industrial sector yeah. that did not previously exist in South Africa. And that we find a, lot, a great deal more exciting. Mm. So when we talk about, for example, beneficiating titanium yes. uh, in, in South Africa, that, that we're not going to do that by having little companies. Uh, that going, we need a whole new sector and, mm. and, and support the whole full value chain for doing so. And to that extent, we're, we're most fortunate to, 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 to um, be supported fully and, and indeed guided by uh, the, uh, our department of science and technology mm. and uh, working together with trade and industry and, 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 and so on to have an overarching strategy of that nature. I'll add as a last uh, element and then I'll stop that. You've got uh, for, the long term, <laughs> ah, <laughs> for the long term, we must, not, we must not ignore the importance also of support, supporting basic science. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's absolutely yeah. fundamental. Basic Particularly science. if we're going to ask questions about what happens in 70 years' time. It is people are going to invent new things that we can't even think about now and they'll arise from people who are doing science today. Mm. Not, yeah. There's one issue we didn't touch on and perhaps, Minister, as a final question, you could weigh in on this. And this is how do we use science, technology and innovation in the agricultural space? If this is our natural advantage uh, on the continent, how do we infuse to make sure that we are the best in the world at p providing food and feeding the world? Mm. Well, um, there are ne a number of things happening on the continent, but you just go out there to the stand uh, uh, where Moringa products are being shown off. Moringa is used by communities throughout South Africa. It's not a naturally grown indigenous plant, but it is used by traditional communities. And uh, they say it's beneficial for a range of uh, 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 ailments that we might have, 
helps boost the immune system. It's excellent uh, with uh, uh, arthritic uh, infections, apparently, uh, and really helps with relief of pain for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. A lot of us don't know this. We don't know Moringa. You don't go and easily purchase it on the shelf. Mm. But you walk into a community of indigenous practitioners. I asked them one day, oh, my legs are really hurting. And I've Moringa. been traveling. And they said, Moringa, in a voice. Now go out there. There's Moringa iced tea, Moringa milkshake. You know, and it's going to go into the commercial space. So that's where science is coming close mm. uh, uh, to, I think, uh, uh, practices and, and remedies that uh, we haven't traditionally uh, been alert to. And what I think science brings is quality assurance, it's understanding of the properties that give rise mm. to the healing that we're talking about, and it's public assurance that actually I can use this product without fear. So uh, this is the sort of unity uh, and affinity I am trying to encourage us to have, because scientists tend to be a bit removed. Uh, it is their products that are close to us. And I'm saying, please come close to the people so that they understand and appreciate that what you bring actually is value and sense. On that note, we started off this conversation with the view to explore, unpack, and maybe even challenge how science, technology, and innovation are stepping up to the social economic challenges that still plague the world. And certainly from the conversations that we've had today, it certainly seems that there is fundamental shifts and new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things and big ideas coming to the fore that are really moving uh, all markets across the African continent towards science and technology innovation that is uh, conducive for investment and is attracting the right kind of funds and really developing the continent. I think that's where we'll leave this conversation. From myself, Nozi Pombandra, until next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.